Welcome to this presentation on cryptanalysis of Psyche. Uh, this is joint work with my co-authors, Greg Costello, Patrick Longa, Michael Nerik, and Fernando Virdia. And this work was done while we were at uh, Microsoft Research. Okay, so the main topic of this, um, uh, this presentation is Psyche. Oh, excuse me. And Psyche is short for uh, super singular isogeny key encapsulation. Um, uh, which is a round two candidate in the NIST standardization uh, process for post-quantum cryptography. I won't go into too much detail here. If you want to know more information, please visit the website, uh, psych.org. Um, so I want to highlight sort of uh, um, um, the work on cryptanalysis that has been done on Psyche. So first of all, the work by Ajay et al, who will look at classical cryptanalysis, um, and then the work by Jacques and Skank uh, initially and uh, much more recently, a very recent ePrint paper by Jacques and Schrodenloer, um, who, uh, uh, who look at quantum cryptanalysis. And then sort of interestingly for Psyche, um, uh, from round one to round two, um, these, these works showed that the, the, the attacks that were considered um, um, to be practical were actually not as easy to execute as initially was thought, um, uh, meaning that the security actually went uh, up a bit, uh, meaning that the parameters uh, could be uh, uh, decreased and therefore uh, uh, resulting in uh, smaller public keys, but also uh, uh, faster execution. So uh, in this talk, uh, we consider uh, uh, further analysis of classical attacks only. We will not look at quantum attacks. Um, 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 it's, a, it's kind of hard to say which of the two uh, uh, um, um, really determines the security of Psyche at this point, uh, which makes it interesting uh, to still uh, uh, consider both of them. Okay, so let's start with a bit of an introduction uh, um, to isogeny-based crypto. So um, um, it started as SIDH, which is super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. Um, and the idea behind is that uh, it's kind of a, a graph-based protocol. Uh, and we built this graph um, uh, from nodes, uh, and these nodes here are going to be um, so isomorphism classes of super singular curves defined over f of p squared, um, where p is some some prime which is chosen uh, as a parameter. So these are sort of uh, uh, sets of curves uh, uh, with the same j invariant. Um, and if we take the set of all these curves, it turns out that they all form a connected graph. Um, um, where the connections here are uh, uh, built, uh, so the, the, the edges between these nodes uh, are built as uh, what's called an isogeny. An isogeny, um, sort of in, in, in simplest terms, is a, is a sort of a very natural map between two elliptic curves. Um, okay, and so uh, uh, it's determined by two fractions of polynomials, f and g, um, uh, written here that just maps the x and y coordinates uh, on one curve to the x and y coordinate um, um, on other curves. Okay, and so these are sort of the edges uh, in this graph. Um, and uh, when we look at the whole graph, it turns out we have about p over 12 of them um, um, for, a for a parameter p. Um, and if we look at a sort of a local view, so we look at a single node, um, then we see that if we fix some prime um, um, uh, L, um, then at each node we'll have L plus one outgoing isogenies. So in this case, um, I, I printed a, a, a big blue dot here which is sort of a, a starting curve, so it's, it's one node. And from that node, we see sort of three outgoing edges, uh, which go to other nodes. Um, and so we can, can, can sort of continue this picture, uh, since every node, or essentially every node, is going to have three outgoing edges. Uh, we can sort of continue drawing this picture uh, uh, on and on. Uh, I won't draw it at the top because it won't fit, but also there, uh, 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 in a generic SIDH setting, it will just continue growing and growing. Okay, and so uh, what does SIDH do? Um, so an SIDH sort of public key computation now uh, starts at this blue node, um, and then it takes a random walk through the graph. So it takes here uh, four green steps, uh, landing on this, uh, this green node, um, and here the green node would be the public key, um, and this, uh, this walk, this random walk would be uh, the secret key. Okay, so another example of a walk would be the following, uh, ending up on a, on a different public key. Okay, so now you can look at how many public keys are there actually. Um, 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 I've drawn 15 uh, here. Uh, you have to be 
Uh, also consider the ones that uh, um, um, that go upwards, which I didn't actually draw here. Um, so if you if you sort of work this out, you can see that in this case there would be uh, 24 uh, different uh, public keys. Okay, and so if we look at uh, cryptanalysis of this, um, so the most naive way you could go about breaking this uh, is a brute force attack, uh, where you simply try each and every one of them until you find the right one. Okay, and so this has uh, the following complexity, assuming we take E2 steps uh, in the graph. Um, the first one has three possibilities, and each step afterwards, uh, since we're not allowed to walk backwards, only has two possibilities. So we get sort of three times two to the E2 minus one uh, probability, uh, a complexity uh, for the attack. Okay, and so sort of one remark immediately we can make here, when we move from SIDH, and sort of generic SIDH problem, um, to a psych problem, so a psych problem as defined in the uh, NIST proposal, we can see that this blue dot is actually not really a generic uh, node. Okay, and so what happens if you look at it, it does have three outgoing isogenies, you can see here in the bottom, but one of them turns out to loop back to itself, um, and two other ones end up looping to a single node. Okay, and so this first step, which should give you uh, three possibilities, uh, actually uh, only gives you a single one. If you assume you don't want to loop back to your uh, to the curve itself, uh, then you can only add, end up on one node. Um, 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 and so the complexity of this attack basically decreases with a factor three. Okay, and so and here you can remark that we're working with big O terms, so this, this 3 actually doesn't change the complexity, and that's true. Um, but the constant hidden in this brute force attack is simply the, the cost of computing an isogeny. Um, 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 and the actual attack here does speed up with, a, with, a, with an actual uh, factor of 3. Okay, and so this is not the best way to attack this. Um, and so what we can do if we assume to have some, some uh, uh, public key that we're attacking, that we're trying to retrieve the secret key from, instead of just starting from uh, uh, this public uh, uh, parameter curve, uh, which is the blue node here, we can also start walking from the public key and try to uh, uh, end up on a shared node in the middle. Okay, so we sort of walk ha halfway from both sides. Um, and by the way the site parameters are set up, uh, it's guaranteed that there's only a single node um, um, uh, which uh, connects the two halves. In this case, uh, the node uh, labeled four, uh, which I made blue. Okay, and so uh, what is the complexity of this? Um, well, in the sort of the most ideal case, you can uh, walk halfway uh, from one side and store everything in the middle. Um, and then you get a, a square root complexity. You get sort of a, a baby step, giant step kind of thing. Um, if your memory isn't as large that it can, can store all that, which uh, for typical psych parameters it won't be, and then you can choose a smaller memory, um, um, uh, which does increase uh, the runtime then. So you get sort of a linear trade-off, where if you have a memory of size w, um, um, you get a speed up uh, uh, with a, a factor w. Okay, and so in practice, uh, um, uh, these memories that we have available to us are actually fairly small compared to uh, uh, sort of the parameter sizes that we work with. And so there's an additional algorithm. So this is called the VOW, the Van Orschot Wiener uh, algorithm, which works better than meet in the middle, um, assuming that your memory is small. So if your memory is smaller than um, 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 sort of than the square root of the number of public keys, and then this Van Orschot Wiener will outperform the generic meet in the middle attack. Um, and so it has the following complexity, 2 to the 3 times e2 minus 1 over 4 divided by the square root of w. And you really work out uh, that if w is the square root of, uh, of the number of public keys, um, it will basically have the same complexity as, as meet in the middle, and any larger memory uh, will be better for meet in the middle. Um, okay, and so here um, we, we can make another couple of remarks about psych. Um, so first of all, um, there are some choices that are made in the psych proposal. Uh, which uh, have an influence uh, on its security. A small influence, but an influence nonetheless. Um, so the first choice is the fact that the starting curve is a subfield curve. And by subfield curve here, I mean a curve defined over f of p, which is a subfield of the uh, sort of the field f p squared, um, um, in which the j invariant of all these curves is guaranteed to lie. Um, and the influence that has is that uh, subfields curves have Frobenius endomorphisms. Um, 
Um, and this Frobenius endomorphism leads to uh, um, um, sort of conjugate classes. Um, okay, and so now we have sets of nodes um, which are connected by the Frobenius endomorphism. Um, 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 and so this is very similar to the case of polar rho on, on classical uh, uh, elliptic curve to Fihelman, uh, where you have a, a point, but also minus its point, leading to a conjugate class uh, 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 by the minus one map. Here we have a similar conjugacy, conjugacy class, uh, only induced by a Frobenius map, um, and this means that sort of the uh, uh, yeah sort of the the, the the entropy from one uh, side, so walking from the from the subfield curve, is is decreased by a factor two. Um, um, okay. On the other hand, if we start from the other side, um, due to the choices of arithmetic, so psych works only with Montgomery curves. It turns out that the kernel of the um, uh, of the final isogeny, so the dual of the uh, um, uh, the kernel of the dual of the final isogeny, um, is always going to be the one uh, uh, where the x coordinate of the point is one. And this gives some information away um, about walking backwards. Uh, basically, it gives away the um, um, the first two uh, two isogenies on the on the way back. Uh, so this again also decreases. Um, uh, the number of nodes that we can land on uh, and therefore decreases the complexity of the attack. Okay, so if you look at VOW and Psyche, uh, we go from uh, two, 3 times uh, E2 minus 1 uh, uh, to 3 times E2 minus 4 over 4 divided by uh, square root W. Okay, and so this is Venorsha Wiener. I didn't actually explain how Venorsha Wiener worked. So, so uh, as it's such an important algorithm, um, I want to spend some time going through it. Okay, and so the problem it solves is, is a meet in the middle problem. So we have two functions, h0 and h1, um, that map from some set s, so these are just the integers from 0 to n minus 1, to some other set t, which in this case are going to be sort of the nodes in our, in our graph. Um, and you want to find some x and y such that uh, h0 and h1 uh, collide. Okay, and so the way we do this is we define uh, uh, several functions. So we define a family of functions, um, which do the following. So they take an input uh, as an input, uh, uh, first of all, an element of the set S, uh, set here, but also a bit B. Um, okay, and so um, what, what it now does is it takes an element Z and it evaluates the function uh, uh, H0 or H1 determined by the bit B. So it looks at the bit B, if it's zero, it evaluates H0 at Z, if it's one, it evaluates h1 at z, um, and then to the output it applies a g of n, uh, where g of n is just some random function indexed by n. Okay, so for example, it could be sha3 or sha256 or some other uh, hash function which kind of uh, has a, a sort of random behavior, um, and to generate a family of those, uh, we can just domain separate them uh, by this index n. Okay, and so now what happens um, that we get a family of functions indexed by n, and each of these functions uh, has a golden collision, meaning that uh, it's a collision of the function f, uh, f of n, um, such that if we find that collision, it leads back to a solution of the meet in the middle problem. Um, okay, and um, sort of a downside that we have to deal with here is that um, we don't only have a single collision, uh, but these functions fn, they're going to have many collisions, uh, many other collisions, which are kind of useless for our purposes. So we're, uh, we're going to do collision searches on these fn, but there's only a single one we're interested in, and all the other ones uh, we basically throw away. Um, and this is simply a, a called a, a golden collision search um, in any of these functions. Okay, so finally we have to find a collision in one of these uh, functions fn. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, so we assume n to be fixed, uh, and we assume to have a set a star of size n uh, and a memory of size w. Um, and the way the algorithm works is very similar to polar rho. Um, so uh, um, there is some distinguishedness property that says that a fraction theta of this set as star is distinguished, where here theta is defined to be the square root of w over n. And then we start the algorithm by randomly sampling an element z of s star and iter iteratively applying uh, the function fn to it uh, until we get an element that's distinguished. Um, and then we go to the memory 
Um, and we check whether this distinguished point already appears in the memory. Um, if it does not, we simply store our point in memory and we, uh, uh, we sample another element uh, and we start over again. Um, if this distinguished point um, is already uh, in memory, and then we have a collision and we check whether this is the golden collision. Um, um, if it is, we are happy and, and the algorithm concludes. Um, if this is not the golden collision, then we just store our distinguished point in memory again um, and we sample a new element uh, and start over. Um, it could happen that you're, you're very unlucky and you keep resampling elements and finding distinguished points without ever finding the golden collision. Um, um, and in that case, um, you don't want to uh, forever get stuck uh, in the same function. So you want to define um, 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 some way uh, to moving to the next function version. Um, and there's some heuristic analysis by Van Orschot and Wiener um, that say, well, if you have found about 10 times W distinguished uh, points, um, so if you filled the memory up 10 times with distinguished points, um, then you should move uh, to the next function version uh, and try your luck there. Um, so how do we apply this to uh, uh, to SIDH or PSYCH? Um, so here the set is uh, 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 sort of as of size square root the number of public keys. So it's the square root of 2 to the e2 um, in this case. Um, and then we define uh, this these fn uh, as follows. So it looks complicated, but basically what it says, um, we start from ei, um, where uh, this index i, uh, if it's zero, we start from our uh, starting curve, which is a public parameter. If the index is one, we start from the public key. Um, then from either of those two curves, we compute an isogeny walk corresponding to our input z. So z is just some bit string that basically says at each node that we end up on, we, we get two choices and it tells you which of the two to take. Um, and finally, we end up on the J invariant and we apply uh, AES uh, or some variant of AES uh, to this uh, key to put, uh, with N. Um, okay, and so that's, uh, that's some sort of randomly behaved function that we apply to, uh, to the J invariant. Okay, and so, so we implemented all this. Um, if you go through a theoretical analysis of this, um, so we, we ran this for different parameter sets. Um, so for different uh, um, 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 uh, uh, depths of walks uh, uh, for the secret key and different memory sizes. And for those, you can do a theoretical analysis also done uh, by Van Orschen and Wiener that tells you how many um, uh, queries to this function fn you expect. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's plotted here. This exp is the expected value. Um, and so the work by Ajay et al, uh, who also implemented this, um, um, sort of came close to these expected values, but there was still a bit of a gap. Uh, it's unclear where that comes from. It could be um, um, a minor uh, detail in the implementation, or uh, it could be that they didn't average over enough uh, runs. Um, okay, and so if, if we run sort of the same algorithm uh, on, on SIDH, um, uh, we see that we actually get extremely close to this expected value. Um, um, there's uh, um, uh, yeah, 0 0.09 bits different, for example, for, uh, for the first row. Okay, and so it's sort of uh, more interesting, maybe. Um, so what happens when we move from, from generic SIDH to psych? Um, so we can now include the optimizations uh, for the psych parameter choices. Um, so the equivalence classes uh, under Frobenius, but also the, 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 uh, um, the kernel of the dual that's known. Um, and so this decreases the set size by a factor six, um, and therefore the attack decreases by a factor about 15. Um, okay, and so if you run this, uh, you can see that the expected value goes down a lot. And again, our implementation uh, uh, reaches very close to the expected values um, um, and is about a factor 15 uh, faster and then the generic SIDH. Um, okay, and so um, this is a, a sort of theory. It just measures how many queries we need to the Oracle, where the Oracle is basically an isogeny computation. Um, um, and so here uh, um, um, we implemented all this um, um, built on the psych submission. Um, so one advantage of that is, is that it uses the, the fastest available arithmetic. Um, 
Um, so these uh, isogeny uh, uh, walks are constructed using Montgomery curves, just like the Sykes submission, uh, which leads to some speed ups in this oracle, um, which uh, again asymptotically doesn't have much of an influence, but actually running the attack in practice, it will uh, it will speed it up uh, quite significantly. Um, Okay, and so all of this will be uh, published uh, soon uh, on, the, on the following GitHub pages here. Um, I say soon, it, it could be so soon that by the time uh, um, that this is put online, this uh, uh, GitHub will also uh, be online. Um, um, and so uh, yeah, uh, keep, uh, keep a lookout for it. Um, okay, and so um, I think an important uh, remark to make about um, um, implementing this Van Arshot Wiener in practice um, is that naively it's uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, um, um, it's sort of a, a simple algorithm uh, uh, to explain, but there, there are actually many subtleties to it. Um, but for a single instance, um, you know, which has a certain memory available, um, um, it works uh, uh, very well. Um, and there's no significant overhead for the single instance querying memory uh, basically every time it finds a distinguished point. Um, this changes though um, uh, when you go to a more realistic setup. Um, so theoretically, Van Arshel Wiener uh, uh, parallelizes perfectly. So if you have m instances now with uh, some shared memory of size w, uh, the runtime should increase by a factor m, exactly. Okay, and so uh, um, um, uh, as, as, as depicted here, um, but if you try to implement this, you actually see that all these M instances now have to query the same memory um, um, all the time. Um, so there's lots of distinguished points that are found, found, and they have to query this memory to check for collisions every single time. Um, and this actually becomes a, a big problem and becomes a, a big overhead. Okay, and so um, uh, furthermore, um, you now have these instances running, um, and they have to, uh, if they start running on different function versions, and so they, they, they run on different indexes n, um, the collisions that are put into the shared memory become kind of meaningless. So you have to make sure that all these functions um, are running uh, on the same function version all the time. Um, um, so there, there are some synchronization issues there you have to deal with. So what, what we did, so we didn't um, uh, consider yet a sort of a true distributed uh, uh, implementation yet. So we only consider a multi-core. So we assume a single machine with many cores. Um, so uh, we have a 28 core setup, but also we tried uh, with, with bigger setups um, um, where they do share uh, a memory, which is just RAM, uh, but we do have many threads uh, trying to access that memory at the same time, uh, which is already causes a number of issues. Um, okay, and so finally, if, if you assume such a setup, um, if you move towards a distributed setup, um, kind of one interesting area uh, of research would be to look at how could you use some local memory. So yeah, you assume you have a very big database um, of size uh, W, um, but if you have, I don't know, say a Raspberry Pi running, um, it still has a little bit of local memory that you could try to use in some way to, to speed up the computation. Um, um, and so uh, um, um, I will consider, uh, uh, we'll look into some, some available options uh, in the next few slides. Okay, and so if we, if we look at the parallelization, so this is our implementation where on the x-axis we look at the number of cores, and on the y-axis uh, we look at the actual wall time of our implementation, um, and, and measured in seconds here. Um, and as you can see, sort of the average depicts um, just the actual linear optimization compared to a single core. I and mean, we see that the, um, um, uh, sort of the, the expected value uh, depicts that. The average is the average of our runtime um, and it matches extremely close to the, uh, to the uh, expected value, which shows that we're really getting a linear speed up up to 28 uh, uh, cores. Okay, so finally some remarks on how to use this local memory for speeding up the algorithm. Um, the first idea is to use it to uh, speed up the collision checking. Um, and so uh, a short reminder on how we check for collisions. Um, so we assume here we have a collision um, consisting of two triples. Um, one uh, which starts at a point Z and ends in a point Z bar and takes exactly D steps. 
another one starting at a point y, also ending up at the distinguished point z bar, which takes e steps. And here we assume that e um, is smaller than d. Um, and, and, and we know this uh, as we check the collision because we, we store this in memory. Um, and so the way we check for a collision is we start applying our function fn to z uh, several times until we know we have as many steps left as the, uh, the chain length of y. Uh, and here, um, if, if at this point the value of the chain uh, starting at z is the same as y, um, we are kind of unlucky uh, because we've reached a collision without having two distinct inputs. Uh, this is what we call a Robin Hood, Robin Hood collision. Um, if this does not happen, uh, we simply continue walking both chains forward until we do hit the same, uh, the, st the same intermediate point, which is guaranteed to happen because at the end we reach the same distinguished point. Um, so then we have a collision and we can check whether this is the golden collision. So one idea um, is that if we have local memory available, we can simply store all these intermediate points in one of the chains, here in the chain starting at Z. Um, and now if we want to check for a collision, instead of having to walk from Z first and then starting to walk from Y, uh, we actually don't have to walk from Z at all. We can simply start applying Fn to Y until we hit one of the points in the chain of Z, at which point, at which point um, we have a collision and uh, we can check for the golden collision. Um, and here um, you can note that instead of having to walk two chains forward, we only have to walk a single chain forward. Um, so we could hope to get maybe a, a two times uh, speed up here. So in practice, if these chains get longer, um, of course, you may not be able to store all of these intermediate points. Um, instead, you may be only uh, able to store T intermediate points, say, um, and in that case, in that case, there are some um, some smart tricks and ideas um, to optimally store these points um, to still get uh, really nice results and to still approach the two times uh, speed up with uh, uh, with fewer memory uh, requirements. Um, so if you look at uh, the actual improvement here. On the x-axis here, you have the uh, the number of, uh, so basically t, the number of intermediate values that we can store. And on the y-axis uh, is the number of steps that we need to check a collision. Um, and we can see that uh, sort of as it grows, it, it seems to go closer and closer to about uh, half uh, the number of steps, um, um, which is uh, similar to, uh, uh, to what I said before. Okay, and so finally, uh, uh, sort of a nice thing you can do if, if you, um, uh, um, uh, what you can do is that these devices are all computing uh, isogeny walks, basically. So every iteration of Fn is an isogeny walk. Um, and this consists of a, a tree computation as follows. Um, and so now instead of starting at the blue node every time and computing all the way down the tree, um, you can fix some pre-computation depth. Um, and so you can pre-compute all the nodes up to some depth, and now you start to walk only from, from that depth. Okay, so now your isogenies um, um, have a degree uh, decreased by a factor uh, delta, uh, by a linear factor delta, and uh, uh, you have to store a table uh, consisting of uh, two to the delta of these nodes, and each of these nodes uh, uh, consists of uh, six elements in FB squared. So you have six times two to the delta. Uh, elements in fp squared. So this grows very quickly with delta, of course, um, uh, but it could still uh, give you some, some, some small speed ups for these devices. Okay, and so there again, there are some intricacies here. Um, uh, uh, you have to be careful uh, how you actually store these tables uh, and which uh, bases of these torsion points uh, uh, you choose. But again, for more detail, um, uh, see the paper. Okay, and so uh, some two other optimizations that I want to mention. Um, so you can look into uh, uh, multi-target attacks. Uh, um, if you assume two public keys and you only want to retrieve one out of two, um, uh, or uh, uh, and then uh, you can uh, get some, some small optimizations. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, sort of practical uh, uh, speed ups. Uh, for example, uh, these distinguished points, uh, you can, for example, choose them in a way that some bits are zero, in which case you don't have to store those, uh, which leads to some uh, some optimizations because you can now store more points in the fixed uh, memory size that you have available. Okay, 
Um, well, thank you uh, um, for listening uh, um, and enjoy uh, the rest uh, of the conference.